So as we come here today and we, we begin to look at the text, I do tell you that uh, we are like in the fourth, I don't count real well, weeks, but I think we're in the fourth week of Pentecost. And I may be going back a little bit to some texts that you all have heard before, but I thought what a great foundation to go back to Acts chapter 2, particularly starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Turn to your neighbor and help me out here. Say, they were all together in one place. Now, that was so quiet and proper. Turn to your other neighbor and say it like you mean it. They were all together in one place. Some of the fathers just spoke at their daughters loudly. <laughs> Mothers to your sons, okay. They were all together in one place. See, when God shows up, he works his best through the community. When we're all divided, no. When we're all together in one place. See, the disciples, think about what they'd been through. They just watched their Lord, their Savior, nailed to a tree, killed, dead, buried and he said something about the third day and they weren't quite sure that it was for real or they heard it correctly he was raised up next thing you know he appears to him next thing you know he ascends right he goes back and he gives him further instruction go go together wait pray wait until the holy spirit shows up now i don't know about you but i'm i'm one that believes the bible completely but I'm also one that struggles with it all the time. I'm like, you know what, really, God? You want me to do this, and then you'll do that? That doesn't make sense, but it does. So I want to share with you. So earlier in the week, Sharon called me and asked me the question that I've never been asked before in my life. Do you all want to hear it? Yeah, it was a simple one. What's the sermon title? I've never titled a sermon. Good news. Well, apparently that didn't work. So here's what it is. A church alive is worth a drive. Now, you may think that I'm only going to talk about Kimballsville today, but I like history. And I'm one of those history guys that likes to know what happened and how it happened, so maybe we can see how God's patterns will work again. 1905. I'm going to share with you the most unlikely possibility for a church growth that you'll ever hear in your life. And how God worked through it. Okay, in 1905, there was an African-American um, that was a pastor. And he had one eye missing, blind. And he was in Kansas at a little church. And as he was at this little, little church, a lady stopped by and visited. And when she stopped by, she heard a message that seemed to make sense. It seemed to click with her. And God spoke to her and said, you need to get this guy out to California to preach. So as she brought this guy back out to California, okay, and they paid for a ticket to get him there. Incidentally, this guy, William Seymour, uh, was the man. And he had no, um, he was the first one born free. His parents were slaves. So he's the first one with freedom. As he goes out there, she brought him to her church, much like Mr. Don introduced me earlier, right? And she introduced him, and he preached, preached his heart out. Guess what the church did? They said, that was terrible. The trustees got together. They locked the doors. They changed the locks that week. It was so bad. They said, don't ever come back. <laughs> Amen. That's not the sermon. Um, chair trustee promised he's not changing locks earlier. Hallelujah. <laughs> Here's what happens. As the message, as the message uh, there was not where it should have been received, she invited him back to her front porch, and he started to preach there. And as he was preaching there on, 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 uh, on her front porch, they started doing Bible study and praying. And fasting. And they started praying and fasting that the Holy Spirit would show up and do a great thing. And that though he always wanted to be able to have the power of the gospel in Acts, that it had not happened yet. 
But he continued to be faithful and pray and fast and trust God and ask God to send the Holy Spirit. And then as they were there praying and fasting one day, one of those started to speak in tongues. Then another one started to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Then another one started to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And as this happened, God was doing a great work. Because at the height of Jim Crow, at the height of hatred in our country, at the height of division and separation, God showed what he can do. Because as the group of African American was there and inviting the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit showed up, they started praising God. And it was wild. And as they were praising God, what do you think happens? The neighbors start noticing. In fact, the L.A. newspaper noticed. The L.A. newspaper wrote an article that said something like this. This group on, 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 on uh, Bonnie Avenue, I think it was, this group is so wild that they're so unorthodox that there's no reason that this will ever have any roots to it. They're offending many people with their loud praises and thank yous to God. So what do you think happened? That's terrible news, right? Here's what happens. Here's how God worked that out. God took that, and when people read it, what do you think they did? They showed up. And now, next thing you know, within a few weeks, a thousand people were at that house. And then another thousand. And as this went on, as this went on, the thousand people got on that house, and guess what happened to the house? Well, they destroyed it, right? Somebody read the, read the text ahead of time on me. As they destroyed that house, that's not the prophecy for this one. But what I want to share with you is this, is that when God showed up and they started inviting, it started to become a church. It started to become a worship center. And as people came and were seeking answers, God was doing a great thing. That house was destroyed. The world system would say, well, it looks bad. It's over. There's no hope. We're done. But that's not what God had in order in 1906. What God did was he showed him a way to an old building at 312, write it down, A-Z-U-S-A, -A, Azusa Street. As they went to 312 Azusa, they got a good deal. They got it for eight bucks. Did I mention that the pews were non-existent? They, could not, they did not go in and dust and vacuum. They had to get manure shovels. Shovel the manure out of the church. Maybe a sermon there another day. They shoveled all of it out of the church. They cleaned it up. And then they brought in old oak rough cut planks and blocks to put them on. And no pads. In fact, the preacher didn't have a nice shiny pulpit. What the preacher had was a, a crate. And the preacher, Seymour, would go down into that crate sometimes and put his head inside of it. And he put his head inside of it, and they could hear him praying, Lord, do something today. There's nothing left of us. Do something today, God. Show us your power, Lord. Do something today. And they would praise. They would worship. Girls, it's terrible. They didn't even have guitars, no keyboard. They did a cappella music I read. I thought, wow. Incidentally, I love the keyboard and guitars. I think that's great. The power of God. Now, why was this church worth going to? It had nothing. It had old clapboards on it, needed paint. It was an old abandoned African Methodist church that they had built a bigger building and it had fallen into disrepair. It was used as a horse stall. It was used as a construction business warehouse. And now it's going to be a worship center. And they are going to pay eight bucks a month. At the Azusa Street Revival, they didn't even have collection plates up in the front. People were getting right with God, and they were given to God. They never asked for money. The money came. God kept sending the people, and then, therefore, the church was taken care of. Because not of the people coming, but because of the receiving of eternal life. The change that people were getting, the spiritual change they were getting, the hope they were receiving in Jesus. See, these were broken people that were traveling from afar. They were coming to L.A. They were going there hoping that they could receive healing. The piles of crutches at Azusa after two years were so great, they probably would fill half of the sanctuary 
from the pictures I've observed. Because people were flying in. Well, they didn't fly at that time. Let me go back. How were they getting there? Horses, trains, and foot. Okay, they were coming in that way from as far away as Japan, China, the ends of the earth. Many walked in L.A. that came down. And as they came, they were coming, searching for healing. Many of them didn't realize the healing that they were going to receive was from Jesus Christ. Not by a preacher laying hands. Not by, by just showing up and being there in community. But they knew if they went together and they invited the Holy Spirit, that God would do something. See, in the Bible, in the, in the Gospel of Mark and many other places, we see the healing that Jesus went into towns and people were healed. That wasn't why Jesus went. That wasn't the primary purpose. The primary purpose of Jesus here was to bring healing, bring eternal life to the Spirit first. And then, people receive Christ. What happens to them? They become transformed. Their burdens, their weights, their hurts, their pains, they're healed. Brothers and sisters, I look at the eighth verse in the third chapter of Revelation. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you've kept my word and not denied my name. I prayed to God that he would give me another scripture besides Revelation. I prayed, is there anywhere else in the Bible, Lord, that we can go on the first Sunday? And God told me, no, 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 no. This is where you're going. I've been pleading with God for three months now about the first Sunday at Kimballsville UMC. And God keeps bringing me back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Because, see, I've walked around this property and I found almost nothing wrong with it. Yeah. And I'm like, well, okay. Then, just when I thought it was perfect, you guys painted the parking lot and made it even better than what I ever thought. Haven't found anything else that, 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 that you've done like that. But anyway, that's pretty darn good. You've got an opportunity here. Then I started to look at some demographics. Do you know you have 174 houses in, in the village right here? That means I can walk as out of shape as I am from here to the other side of town, and I can do it. And there's 174 houses. That's good news. I haven't looked, in, haven't looked into how many houses are worshiping, but okay. Then I started to realize how close you are to Newark. How close you are, I know how close you are to Maryland, how close you are to the neighboring towns. You don't even got to go that far. A church alive is worth a drive. Now, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and go here with your permission. I'm going to share. Can I keep it real today in Kimballsville? Why not? I did early. I might as well do it now, too, so you don't have to talk to them. You can have first hand. When it was announced I was coming here, I received some text messages from some people. And some of them were pastors. Then I met a pastor and went, oh my gosh, you're going to Kimballsville? We'll be praying for you. <laughs> and I wasn't sure how to take that. But you know what I realized? I realized that you all have little strength. But you've kept God's word. And I realized that God's word never comes back void. And I realized... That you are in a setting, though you've got a beautiful, perfect building, you are sitting in a 312 Azusa Street setting right here. You're sitting in the possibility, the opportunity to become the greatest redemption center in Pennsylvania. To become the greatest connector in Pennsylvania. You're sitting in an opportunity where you're right in the heart of all these towns. And you're on such a main road as 896 you are in an opportunity where it's not about how perfect things are because as far as I'm concerned they're absolutely perfect you're in a setting because of where our hearts are if our hearts are Lord 
please use me. Lord, please allow me to share the love of Jesus. Lord, please allow me to be forgiven. Lord, please allow me to offer hope. Lord, I'm sorry that I didn't trust all the time. See, these are words that I say to myself. Because I come here today and I realize there's no brokenness in the church. There's no sadness. There's no anxiety, right? We always meet our budget, right? You're given an opportunity. You're given an awesome opportunity. What would it look like in Kimballsville if we began to see what God can do and we began to fall in love? I'm not talking about love God like I love God. I'm talking like adore God. Adore God with a love that's so great that the forgiveness that's needed for me to forgive my neighbor, for me to forgive something someone's done, could be seen externally because we truly ask God to forgive us. I could use that big fancy word repent, but Methodists usually run from that word. How about just ask God to help us on a new good path, which is the definition of repent, but anyway. What would it look like to our community, instead of us begging folk to come in to the church, that instead of being here with that, that we realize that God has given us a great mission to forgive one another, to love one another, to seek his will and his face. See, in Matthew 6, verse 33, it says, Seek ye first. Oh my, I'm using King James. Let me go back to words I know. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What does this mean? The folks were asking Jesus, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? And Jesus said, don't worry. At the end of the worry, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. If we seek first what God is asking, what God is hoping for, the love that God needs, the love that God needs us to show the community, God will provide I might go as far as to say, this building's going to get paid off. We don't got to go rent something. We just got to pay this thing off. Can I get an amen? amen? Wouldn't it be nice to be so free that instead of looking at what we owe, we can look at how the patterns of God have cleared up a debt so that we don't have to worry about anything. And we can invite, in fact, we can do this tomorrow. We can invite our community to come to our building and the focus will be not dollars, but souls. Because when souls get saved, when souls get right with God, God shows up in a great way. I had one text, and I didn't use it early, but I use it here so you can tell them you got more, more text than the others. Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. But they that keepeth the law, happy are they. Look, you've kept God's word. That's a good thing. You've been faithful. You've been loyal. God loves each and every one of you. And he sent his son Jesus, not so we could have a building, but so we could change the world we live in. In the name of hope and love. I don't know about you, but I have seen what can happen. I've seen it in numerous Christian settings, be it church or even missions. I've seen what happens when we are guided by the love of Jesus, number one. Now, I'm not coming today saying that you don't love Jesus. Don't hear me wrong. I'm coming today saying that let's focus on the number one, the number one. The love of Christ. See, 312 Azusa was guaranteed to be the greatest failure of all time by the newspaper. But what happened when God showed up was 312 Azusa turned into the greatest movement of all time. In fact, do you know a church got started out of that? Pentecostal movement started at 312 Azusa. There's a whole lot of churches came out of what was predicted to be nothing. I personally believe 
in each of you. I believe in you. I believe God can work through you. I believe God has worked through you. And I believe that you probably have a little bit of strength. Hopefully that's not because I'm preaching too long. Bob's good. Bob's good. How about you? The love of Jesus. See, what I want you to know is, is as we go down to things like, and you probably heard of the Paris Foundation, right? Good. I know Pastor Mike preached last week. As we go and do missional work like that, do we do it to earn our way to heaven? No, we do it to show and share the love that's within our hearts. As we come to church here and sometimes I guess we fix stuff up. Incidentally, I, whenever you have a work day, call me. I love tearing stuff up at church. But you fixed everything. We'll have to find something to work on. Look, I got everybody writing notes down. They're going to bring them to me. <laughs> hey, what about working together? What about loving God together? What about when the world system says, and I might even say even the church system says, have you heard what happened in the little village over there at Kimballsville? Let's take a ride and see what God is doing. See, brothers and sisters, it's not about as good as that food is that we had between services. It's not about that. It's about him. And to make a full cross, you connect with your neighbors. What would happen if instead of, instead of worrying, we started praising? See, in Azusa Street, they started praising. They started thanking God. And the healing came when they started receiving and thanking God and thanking Jesus and thanking Jesus and thanking Jesus. See, I thank Jesus that we got some of the things we got to work through because the power of God will be so strong here that you'll say there is a God in Israel. You'll say he is alive and well and he loves me. He loves you. And you'll be so unashamed of the gospel that I believe and I trust that the love will flow and flow. See, brothers and sisters, in 92, I guess this church went through a tough time, huh? Mr. Palmer, you're the only one I know. All right, I got two of you now. All right, I got three of you, four of you. Well... Probably looked pretty bad that foggy morning when the church was down and burnt to nothing. And I learned that the fellowship hall went with it. God had better plans than to eliminate the church of Methodism in Kimballsville. God had better plans. And God's got better plans today. Now you might not have got a pastor with a good haircut. And I may not be the best dressed one you're ever going to meet. But what I know is that I love Jesus and I love each of you. And I know that this church has some faults. But I come as a human pointing you to the one who has no faults as Jesus. I look forward to being able to meet with you. Incidentally, this is your plug and since this might be recorded, I'll say it. I look forward that we can come to your house and we can eat with you. See, I didn't get this physique without meeting people. <laughs> Notice I don't stand sideways when I preach. I come looking to get to know you, to get to walk with you through your hard times, to get to praise with your hard times or your, your good times. And I come to you with good news. Because, brothers and sisters, as I've said like nine times, God is not finished here. The patterns of God that have gotten this church through the tough time when it was burnt to nothing and rebuilt what you see here today. The patterns of God that gave vision for the, the Sunday school wing and the gymnasium. Visitors, do you know there's a gymnasium here? What a hidden gem. Even got little bars on the windows so when I'm playing basketball as a pastor with the youth and the youth leader, I don't break nothing and get fired. That's good. That is why they're there, right? Okay, good. <laughs> this church has so much potential. And God is not finished with it. God was not finished with it then. God is not finished with it now. 
I know some of you, you came under Pastor Dave, and he's the only pastor you've ever had. I want to thank Jesus for you hanging in there, because how scary is it when there's a pastor change? I've been in the seats and been through it. I thank God for 17 years of ministry where he and his family built this church up in the name of Jesus. I thank God for how they built this foundation on it and built up the kingdom of God here. I look forward to being able, now that the baton has been passed, I look forward to being able to grab and run with it, but not run ahead of you. Let's put our track shoes on together and run the race for Christ. I'm not going to take up a whole bunch of time. It is July 4th weekend. we got things to do. You haven't denied Jesus. You've kept him number one. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for the time that we have here together. And I ask God that you would help this church to continue to grow and the love to continue that I've seen and experienced. And Lord, as the world shows us, as the world shows us that there's no reason that this church is going to make it, we stop by here today to say thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. We stop by here to thank you, Lord, for what you have done. We stop by here, Lord, to say praise you in your almighty name. See, God... We know that you're a loving God and we want to receive and respond to your love. So God, right now, we just ask that you would do a great thing here. We ask this not on our behalf, but because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.